Well, hello and welcome to the educational power of creating comics. Uh, my name is Tom Racine. I'm a cartoonist. I color the Sundays and uh, for Lincoln Purse's strip, Big Nate, a little bit of self-promotion there. I also do his books, Max and the Midnight. Uh, I've hosted a few dozen panels at various comic cons on the educational uh, net nature of comics and graphic novels. So I'm really excited to be a part of Reading with Pictures inaugural conference on this with an amazing panel of people who will help teach us how to actually create comics in the classroom, which is something I think we need to do more of. Uh, it is part of Reading with Pictures teaching uh, virtual event. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting and promoting the use of comics and graphic novels in education. And my panelists here today are Michael Bitts, Kerry Friedman, Kathy G. Johnson, and Christina Maldonado Badhand. And I will have each of you introduce yourself a little bit, just a quick little bio, give me your, uh, your elevator pitch on what you do. And we'll start with Michael. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thanks, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for being a part of this panel. And thank you to Reading with Pictures for setting this up. My name is Michael Bitts. And for the past over 20 years now, I have been helping young people create comic books. Uh, this started as a literacy initiative in New York City, uh, became known as the Comic Book Project, very generic name, uh, but became this opportunity for first youth in New York City to write, design, and then publish original comic books. And that spread throughout the US in the uh, 1990s into the 2000s, and then uh, more recently internationally. So I've had the chance to help educators and young people in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, in Kazakhstan to write, design, develop, and publish original comics as a pathway to literacy and creativity. And so I look forward to sharing some of those experiences with you, sharing some ideas with how to help your youth create comics, and also supporting this community of people who are bringing creativity into the classroom. I think it's an incredibly important mission. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to say this multiple times during this whole thing is basically, I wish this was when I was a kid. Boy, I wish this had happened. <laughs> I tell you. Um, Carrie Friedman, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, um, I'm a professor of art and design education at Northern Illinois University. I also teach a course on comics and education. My primary work besides being a researcher is to doing teacher education for art and design teachers in K-12. Um, so I'm part of what I do is help teachers use comics in the classroom in art education environments, of different sorts. Excellent. And I'm really excited to be here again. I love these Reading with Pictures panels and thanks everyone for joining. Thank I'm also much. the um, Vice President of Academics for Reading with Pictures, I should mention. <laughs> little insider information. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy G. Johnson, who has uh, the possibly coolest background with the most comics. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you, Tom. Um, my name is Kathy G. Johnson. I am a cartoonist, printmaker, and educator. Um, I My latest graphic novel is called The Breakaways. It's for uh, middle grade students. Um, <laughs> And I also, I've been teaching comics um, as like an artist teacher and just classroom teacher um, since 2012. I got my master's degree from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2017 in teaching and learning in art and design. And I wrote my thesis about the benefits of teaching comics in the visual arts classroom. Um, I have a website called comicarted.com that has like all sorts of educational resources and like student gallery and reading lists and stuff um, as uh, resources for other educators and caretakers. Um, but I also am an artist and a teacher and I also was at a summer camp all day so I am very disgusting <laughs> so I like ran in here <laughs> so I'm fresh fresh from the children <laughs> so you can have your stories from today That's what I have stories it. from today <laughs> uh Christina Maldonado Badhand can you tell us a little bit about yourself please yeah for sure and I'm I'm honored to be with everybody that's really cool hearing what everybody does um I'm a teaching artist, graphic designer, illustrator here in Denver. Um, I've been teaching comics with Pop Culture Classroom and in various other ways uh, throughout the Denver community. I do a lot of work with the native population out here, a lot of representation in pop culture 
panels and things and comic cons. I also actually organized a comic con. I was the director of Indigenous Pop X, which was the first Indigenous centered comic con here in Denver. Um, and we're hoping to do another one that'll be more on independent creators, uh, BIPOC creators, but uh, will be called IACON. It was supposed to happen in 2020, but we all know how that went. So <laughs> hopefully fall of 2022 um, is our next big plan. And then I also am a comic artist and creator. So my, my graphic novel is called Cowie. Um, again, was supposed to be out, but 2020 hit us pretty hard. So I'm hoping to be able to release mm. it um, for Denver Fan Expo coming up this next fall and be able to catch up with that. And then I'm also um, started a publishing company with my husband, IS Studios, which we're kind of operating on the down low again because of COVID. But um, he is a comic artist as well and produces Pia and I'm the colorist on that comic as well. Sweet, excellent, excellent. I think we can all agree that 2020 was just, we all hit the pause button and now we're back. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's start off with that. I want to start off with the overview question I like to ask in these panels, which is basically uh, when I was a kid, I'm extremely old and comics were always in that sort of realm of like, oh, they're for kids. They, no one did. You shouldn't be reading them. Uh, I have a story I tell about my mom where somebody said, how can you let your child read comics? And my mom, who was born in the depression, looked at this person and said, he's reading, isn't he? And I always loved that. I thought that was very ahead of her time for that, which was nice. And I love that this is happening. But I want to ask uh, sort of each of you, why do you think comics in general is a strong educational tool for kids? And then we'll get into the creation of comics, which is kind of a slightly different concept. But let's go ahead and start with Michael. Why do you think comics uh, should be taught and why? And did you have like a particularly aha moment of like working with a kid or when you were reading graphic novels or comics and realized they had potential? So, Michael? Well, I have to say... It's, a, of course, a great question, something that's been in the journals and in the news for the last 20 years now, comics and education. Um, I have to say that I enter this space much more as an educator than a comics professional. I'm very much an outsider to the comics world. I always love reading new comics and meeting new people and new comics creators. Um, but the, from my perspective, um, the opportunity for young people to get involved in a sequential visual narrative, uh, one that can really support their uh, reading and their uh, comprehension skills. Uh, it's so fascinating. When you look at a children's book, and I think Kerry is probably on the same lines with this kind of thing, you know, if you look in the Eric Carle book, you know, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? You can never imagine that book without pictures. It would be totally ridiculous. And what young child would ever want to look at that? Um, but for some reason, as kids get older in school, um, we start to take the pictures away. And there's not a very good rationale for doing that. Um, the visual image is very powerful. Of course, it tells a huge amount of um, part of the story. Um, but also, you know, there's a real tie-in to traditional literacy, like reading words and visual literacy, you know, when you see the word cat, you immediately picture a cat in your mind. There's a visual image associated with this. And educational theorists will go back to you know, Jean Piaget in the you know, 19th century, who identified these connections that young people form. So a lot of times in school, we kind of work against this natural um, affinity for the visual image. And that's what comics is really all about. So in my experience is really all uh, been about kids creating comics. I'm not the best answer about, you know, why graphic novels specifically in the classroom, but this whole world of comics is such an opportunity for learning and creativity and exploration. So I've seen so much power there. And I know that everybody else will talk about that as well. Carrie, let's, uh, let's turn to you uh, from an educational standpoint. Why do you think comics are a good teaching tool for kids? I'm, I'm going to apologize for my voice because I'm just coming off strep throat. So it's oh. a bit rough. So I'll do my best I can. <laughs> I didn't get sick for the entire time we had masks on. I take my mask off the first day. I pick up strep throat. So there you go. Um, so I, I just wanted to start out by saying one of the things that make comics valuable in school is because they motivate kids to learn. Um, there's that wonderful interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, intermodality thing going on that always motivates kids. You know, when you start connecting the visual arts with other subject areas, you, you kids get really excited. And so that's one of the great 
reasons for using comics in school, but there are so many others connected to visual arts learning. I know other people will be talking about, um, you know, the, the textual or narrative quality of comics and how that is an advantage for kids. But let me just say some things about the visual arts uh, skills and concepts that kids learn. Um, when creating sequential art, students learn all of the same things that they learn whenever they're making any kind of two-dimensional art. And so they learn the, the same concepts and skills that they learn when they're learning painting or drawing or any other kind of two-dimensional art. So from an art education perspective, that's a great asset because not only are students learning the same skills and concepts that they would learn with other visual arts forms, but they're also learning how to narrate them. And we do, we do have a phrase in the visual arts called narrative art, which is usually a single panel that tells a story. And so com making comics is a great bridge between, you know, the textual narrative and the concept of narrative art, you know, as a single panel. So there are a lot of advantages just from the perspective of teaching art. Kids learn composition, they learn color scheme and so on, but they also have this great advantage of learning about narrative at the same time. You, you, you asked for sort of a story or maybe an aha moment or something like that. Mm -hmm. And my, my story isn't an aha moment because it took place over several years, but <clears throat> it started when I met a boy in third grade as part of a research project I was doing. And he was starting to draw manga on his own. And part of the reason for this is because his older brother was drawing manga at the time. And his art teacher who happened to be a graduate student of mine, um, because I was in the school for this research project, pulled me aside and asked me about whether or not he should let this boy make manga in school. And the, the boy was so invested in manga at the time, he didn't want to do his other assignments, he just wanted to draw manga. And he was kind of struggling through it on his own. And so I, you know, I, I talked to my student who of course you know, because I'm a visual culture person, my, my art education program is invested heavily in visual culture. Um, you know, I, of course, said, well, yes, <laughs> yes, comics should be in school. Absolutely, no question. So he continued to work with this boy and helped him develop his skills, hone his skills. And when the boy went to junior high school, just coincidentally, that teacher also had been my student previously. And, um, she contacted me and said, you know, do you want to come and take a look at this boy's work? He's, he's still drawing manga. So I went over to the junior high school and took a, took a look, look at his work and he had become, his, his artwork had become really sophisticated. He was using these incredible color schemes. It was clear that he was developing his own characters and own storylines. Um, and, you know, I think his work would, you know, really high level for a junior high school student. And so she spoke to me about what to do about this, this young man and um, in terms of his work. And since, you know, since he was learning so much from the work that he was doing in manga, I said, you know, go ahead and let him do it. Just try to, um, you know, he, he's learning in part autodidactically. So see if you can help him with that, but also try to expand his horizons a little bit which I understand she did. And then st very strangely, by the time he got to high school art, his art teacher was also a student of mine. And <laughs> she, had, she had spoken because she was friends with the junior high school teacher. They had spoken together about this boy. And the junior high school teacher said, you know, Carrie actually met him in third grade on a research project. You might want to just get a hold of her. <laughs> and so she contacted me and I went over to the school and he was doing the in most incredible surrealistic large scale paintings, uh, just unbelievable mm. stuff. And you can see his color schemes from junior high um, had become even more sophisticated. And so I, I spoke to him about it. We talked about all the things he had learned as a result of starting with manga early in life. And I said, so what do you want to do, you know, when you graduate? And he said, I want to become a professional artist. And the next thing I knew just some months after that is that he had been accepted to the Chicago School of the Art Institute with a scholarship mm -hmm. and he's now a practicing artist. So that, there wasn't an aha moment, in a, in a, in a, in a, <laughs> but 
I learned a lot from talking to that young man and the many other students I've talked to about creating comics over the years. But he was the, he was the thing probably more than anything else that motivated me to create my comics and education class for graduate students, meaning teachers who are in service, particularly who, who didn't know anything about comics. And a lot of my students are like that. They just don't know about comics. They don't know how to guide students who want to do comics. That was one of the biggest issues that came out in my conversations with the teachers um, because I had had them as undergrads and we don't have time as under, you know, an undergraduate teacher education program to spend a lot of time on comics per se, which I am changing in our own program. <laughs> um, so we need to do more of that. And I really think contact, we, we've talked a lot about this in reading with pictures lately about um, communicating with teachers in terms of just guiding students to learn mm -hmm. both the narrative and the visual aspects of creating comics. So that's, well, I that's like, I like how this is a whole tree. It starts with you, goes to other teachers, brings down to kids. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. I love that. Um, turning to Christina, uh, because we talked a little bit before we recorded here and I want to talk to the, the two artists, uh, Kathy and you, but uh, Christina, you actually had said something that I wanted to bring up is I used to draw all the time when I was learning, but it just kind of helped me. My mind was occupied here, but I could still listen and take notes. And I did better in those classes where teachers weren't sort of like breathing down my neck about drawing Thor all the time. And you were saying that you had done the classes that you were, you're like your math teacher had done. Could you talk a little bit about that? And also in, in general for you, again, why uh, comics in general are, do you think are good educational tools? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so the only classes I've ever gotten good grades in in math um, was actually a teacher in middle school who my pre-algebra class geared a lot of my assignments to being more visual and artistic and actually got an A, never gotten an A in, in pre-algebra before. Um, and then in high school, I had a geometry teacher who started giving me sacred geometry and uh, had letting me do more of the art side of things, because I was always drawing in their class, you know, I was always doing, um, practicing eyes and mouths and noses and things, trying to get better at different things. Um, and I think for me, like really, I guess, kind of the same, not really an aha moment, but like a combination of experiences growing up. I'm definitely a nerd. I always have been. <laughs> and um, when I was actually really little, I didn't know how to read. Like for some reason, it kind of fell through the, the cracks. People didn't realize that I couldn't read because I was so imaginative and I was really good at telling stories. So I actually did not learn how to read until I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, people just did not realize that I just didn't know how to read. And I was constantly looking at comics and comics actually really helped me start reading and get over my dyslexia. Um, I had dyslexia until, well, and I still kind of do, especially with numbers, <laughs> but with um, when I was in like third grade, they did a reading test on me and realized I like could not read a sentence to save my life. Basically, it's just, I knew all the comics because I could read the panels and I could tell what was happening that way. And I could tell people like amazing stories and stuff. So it just kind of fell through the cracks. But as a artists I just kind of kept following comics and uh, just loved the stories I felt a lot of uh, connection with them I saw a lot of good representation um, particularly in Marvel comics Marvel fangirl Wolverine became my babe my favorite superhero because of an uh, issue where he fights in Chagula which is actually a sea monster from my tribe so I was like that is awesome um <laughs> And I started reading ElfQuest really early, which <laughs> on reflecting now, I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, an eight-year-old probably should not have been reading ElfQuest, <laughs> but it led to some really amazing things now. And uh, I actually started teaching comics because when I was, I went to school at the Art Institute of Colorado here and they started doing Denver Comic Con and I volunteered for a day because, you know, you volunteer for a day, you get two tickets for the whole <laughs> con or however many days you'd volunteer. And I went to help out in the kids' corral, and I'd actually never really been a kid person at that point. Like, now I, I love kids, but at that point, I didn't understand why they liked me. I didn't, I felt very socially awkward around them. I went to volunteer in kids' corral, and my other volunteer left me. He went to the bathroom and never came back. So I had 25 five-year-olds, all of them wanting to draw different superheroes. And I was like totally trial by fire, 
but I ended up doing really well and having them help me draw different characters and they were like my little assistants and pop culture classroom saw that and they actually asked if I wanted to start teaching in their after school program and then it just kind of went from there I just started helping out with them and doing their curriculum the artist side of things and then it just kind of snowballed into what I do now but um, I think just being I was one of those students you know where comics actually really helped me and like the art side of stuff really helped me so I can really relate to a lot of the things I see in other students where I'm like, oh yeah, I totally love anime. Of course, now I feel kind of old because a lot of the anime that I recommend, I'm like, that's 20 years old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, feels really It'll continue weird. continue to happen, trust me. Like, oh, I know, I know. It's, it's getting pretty, I'm like, Inuyasha is like 20 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I spend all this time now talking to people about Marvel movies. All right, this was an obscure Thor comic from 1975, but they brought it back. I mean, it's just, oh, geez, crazy. But I also, I always tell, I always tell my artist friends, if you're ever feeling down about yourself, draw with a bunch of kids because you're like a wizard. They just, mm -hmm. they just, they gravitate to it. They want to draw. I love that aspect. And that's another reason why I always under, never understood why they took picture books out because we all obviously love them. So it just seems weird that it's taken us this long to circle back to that. So... Kathy, I want to ask you the same sort of question. As an artist, how did you re uh, did did you draw a lot in school? Was it something that helped you? And also, how do how do you feel that uh, comics help with the way you teach? Obviously, in your your day camp that you just ran from and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I did draw. I drew since I was the. I don't know since I could hold a pencil. I mean, I feel like that's true that for all artists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I'm like, I don't know when I started. Um, I am, I am like a manga. I was like a manga teen. I like got, I have like the very first issue of Sailor Moon that got published in a floppy in 1997. <laughs> like, I feel like I was just waiting for it to show up. Um, I don't know, but it, I don't know how much it like, I always took art classes. I got A's in all my classes. Um, but like, but I always took every art class I could and then I went to an art magnet high school in Minnesota which was fun um and then I also I self-published comic book zines as a kid um and I would sell them to the local comic shop wow, and then they would go. sell them for me <laughs> yeah. um and then uh but then um, what I really liked is that you could make it yourself and you could share it with other people and it was very simple and that's still something that to this day I attracts me to the medium just like I can draw it I can xerox it and I can give it to my friend and it, there's like an immediacy <laughs> and when you teach zine making to a teen you can see the like light up because it's just such an amazing thing um but like, so I actually got my start teaching. Now I'm like an art teacher. I teach all sorts of stuff, but I got my start teaching by a friend um, at, hey, being like, hey, do you, can you help me out? Do you want to help me out? I know you are a cartoonist. Do you want to help me at this library? I'm doing a workshop. I'm doing a comic book workshop. And I was like, just like Christina said, I was like, I'm not a kid person. I don't know. <laughs> and then it's amazing. What's what's wonderful is like their their the purity of their ideas, the purity of their excitement. And like what makes comic making comics so fun and amazing is that it's not about and a lot of art because I'm an art teacher basically. So like in so many art forms, so many kids are just like, I can't draw, I'm not an artist. But with comics, it's like it doesn't matter what it looks like, it just has to be fun. When people look at it, they want to have a good time. <laughs> like, because we all we all agree that Peanuts is like incredible draftsmanship. But if he drew Charlie Brown in like a fine art course, do you think Charlie Brown would have like the first Charlie Brown would have gotten an A? Probably not. But it's like there's so much joy in it. And I think that's what makes it so wonderful and why it's so precious in the art classroom, not even just the art classroom, in any classroom, is that if a kid is like, I don't know what to draw, it's like, well, now you can write. Go ahead, write what would be fun to write. And then they start writing and then they're like, oh, I have this idea for what this alien should look like. And I'm like, go ahead and draw the alien. I don't care what you do. As long as they naturally want to go back and forth between the visual and the verbal. 
And um, so it just like, it like is beautiful and it snowballs and I just enjoy goofy chaos. <laughs> <laughs> hence, hence the art teacher. <laughs> just love, all I want is everyone screaming about aliens. That's like, that's like a dream of mine. Um, and just like joy and finding joy in the classroom, just like Cherry was saying, there's just like a lot of joy when it comes to having comic books and it makes you want to learn and then I like I was thinking about the other day I was like offering some books because I haven't seen my summer kids in two years right so I was offering some books I was like hey I got a stack of books because like sometimes kids are having a bad day they don't want to do something and I'm like well I got a bunch of books you want to read a book and she was like I don't want to read a book and I was like but last time two years ago you read like every book I brought and she was like, oh, but those are comics. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm so sorry, but you were reading. <laughs> I hate to break this to you, kid, but uh, I was teaching you. <laughs> you know, you, you bring up an interesting point because one of the things that I love having seen the webcomic world explode is that when I was a kid, you read the comics and they were amazingly drafted and you'd see Jack Kirby and John Byrne and John Romita. But nowadays, I love the fact that, uh, like, I always use XKCD as an example mm -hmm. of amazingly brilliantly written and stick figures. And I think yeah. that that makes it so accessible. You have so many examples now of webcomics that go from stick figures to Renaissance art. And that's wonderful, I think, to show kids. It doesn't have to be this. It can be this, you know. So I think that's a great thing. Michael, yeah, I want to turn to you. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead oh, again. just talking about accessibility. I also like that you just need a pencil and paper. The cheapest yeah. things, yeah. super available, and you can right. make amazing stuff. And a 27-inch Cintiq and a <laughs> thing. Okay, no, that's right. <laughs> Um, Michael, I want to turn to you in terms of now let's get into the nitty gritty about actually creating comics. And I, I'm going to start with you. Um, so what, are, what is something, if somebody was very interested in doing this, if somebody was really interested in, in teaching this, how do they go about it? What are the materials they're going to need? How do, how do you get them to actually start doing this? Give me some insights on that. Okay, uh, I'd like to actually share my screen. That will make it easier to talk about. So here it comes, screen share. Everyone cross their fingers. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to just use this uh, little PowerPoint as a way of talking about how we help our young people in the comic book project write and design comics. And I love what everybody else was saying, Christina, uh, Carrie, and Kathy, um, about you know, the joy of making comics. It has to be fun. It has to be exploratory. It has to be you know, individualized. You know, as Kathy said, like, you, you can't imagine what kids would come up with. It's like so incredible. So when you give them this space to create something where there was just a shape or blank paper, it's just set the whole classroom off running. And so even kids who never identified as artists are suddenly drawing and kids who are struggling to write are suddenly writing and they're collaborating. And so that process for us, it starts with really simple lines and really simple shapes because we don't want to shut anybody out of the process of creating comics. So we, you know, we, we will present kids with like a triangle or a circle or whatever, and be like, well, what's the most interesting thing you can turn this into? And of course it will range from aliens to dresses, to pyramids, to, you know, weird stuff. Um, and no, none of them will be alike. And that's one of the beautiful things about helping kids create comics is that you know, no matter what your process is, there's going to be this sort of individual path that each student is going to take. And then having them share that with each other and talk with each other. So uh, this uh, fifth grader from Cleveland turned a triangle and dropped ice cream. And I use this as an example because, you know, any of us could have drawn this dropped ice cream, any kindergartner, any first grader, but it's the quality of the idea that then flows through your mind, uh, you know, down your arm, you could almost imagine it, to the pencil and then onto the paper. So we start with really simple lines and shapes. We encourage facial expressions. So having kids draw facial expressions is powerful for us. And I just pulled like a couple of um, snippets from kids' comics, uh, just as an example of facial expressions uh, from like their finished product. Um, so the one on the, on the left of the screen says, meanwhile, Dr. Snout was setting a trap. I love Dr. Snout's facial expression. It's like these arched eyebrows, this little snout, the little skewed mouth. Of course, you know, you can come up with great adjectives to describe him. You know, he's sinister, he's villainous, he's menacing. But just isn't it amazing that those simple lines and shapes 
would get you there. And then similarly on the right-hand side, um, this was created by two fourth graders in the Bronx in New York City. And these two characters are fighting over a park. And you can see the characters are identified by different flags, Puerto Rican on one side and Dominican Republic on the other. And this character in the middle, Global Man, is helping them resolve their problem. So this one girl saying, she told me to get out of the park and I don't like your kind either. And look at the facial expression of this girl saying, oomph. You know, it's that squiggly line, it's wide open eyes. And so we really try to get young people to engage in facial expressions. Even if you're drawing stick figures, facial expression will make that comic come to life. We talk a lot about writing in a comic. And so we talk about the difference between captions and dialogue. Uh, so this fifth grader from Queens, New York, uh, was experimenting with um, captions and dialogue. You can see Roy was a normal whiz kid who loved it, experimenting, inventing things. Once he made a blasting rocket, and then the dialogue says, I'm going to make an invention that cleans trash. I love this little lab made of like rectangles and circles and stuff. And you can see those, those two plugs aren't going to fit together. And he's going to go into that machine in the back and it's going to turn him into like an uh, environmental superhero. We talk about panels and the, the power of panels and helping uh, you think like a movie director. So, you know, close-ups and pullbacks and then using panel space in very purposeful and creative ways. We help kids draft a manuscript. These are very basic writing concepts. You know, who's your character? What's your plot? But we need to start somewhere. We often think about different themes and helping kids use themes. Uh, the manuscripts are, you know, really meant to be drafting tools. And so um, thumbnail sketches, we use the manuscripts to then help the kids create the comics so we can sort of put those side by side. And then so once we had these, uh, you know, amazing finished products, we love to publish the student work. This is a publication from Cleveland in, I want to say 2008, I think it was. Um, the theme was tolerance and acceptance. And so that was what the kids were creating their comics on. We love to have exhibits of the youth work and really try to motivate the kids to uh, know that their comic is going to be seen around the world. And you know, Tom, you were talking about web comics. Well, when you publish a kid's comic online, it could be enjoyed by anybody around the world. And that's such an awesome motivator, motivational tool for the kids to you know, realize that your comic could be seen by somebody in China or you know, Africa or anywhere around the world. They really want to get the writing right. They want the art to look good. And they want to be able to celebrate that sh and share that locally and globally. So that's like a snapshot of our process with the comic book project. And we can get into more details later. Or, you know, I'll certainly provide my contact info, um, but it's sort of like, like the global view of how we help kids make comics. I'll stop the share now. That is awesome. No, I love that stuff. And I, I do love the fact that, uh, um, you know, the, the internet has made it so much easier to share a thing. I mean, I would draw something and I'd show the idiot next to me and that was about it. You know, I mean, maybe my brother, but maybe not. <laughs> so it's, it's great that there's this whole, this whole place out there to do this. Um, Christina, I want to talk to you a little bit about what you teach uh, the kids and, and what kind of materials you use and, and your approach to it sort of is a, a, you know, a, a nitty gritty approach to, you know, how do you actually teach it? Yeah, uh, very much the same way, actually. Um, especially with pop culture classroom, we had a lot of things like problems in our world and helping them formulate a story that we could follow. Um, I usually go storyboard approach. Um, and we do little thumbnails to plan out our panels. I teach the Z format of the kind of the psychology of the comic page of how you follow each of the panels. Um, for me, I really, I push research. So, um, you know, when we're st first starting out a comic class with the kids, I do a one sentence story. So it'll be something like the robot saved the earth. And then we try just on one comic page, like I let them pick whether they want a three panel or a five panel and just drawing out that one sentence to tell their story. So they can usually come up with their, um, their sentence, but that's just the example I usually use. And uh, that just kind of gets the creative juices flowing and gets them used to how they might plan that out as a comic. And then they start kind of planning their own. And then if, um, if any of them are really into comics, I really push the research side of things because and I'm really big on making sure that you have the representation right because, you know, comics is a really great, powerful tool, but it also can put out some misinformation if you're not careful. 
And so I always make sure that they kind of know that if that's something that they want to do a social justice comic or they want to do something about the problems that they're seeing in their world. If they don't know all their information, you know, comics were a tool for propaganda at some point. So that's, um, that's kind of the lessons that we usually go over. And I personally, I love the fact of that comics are a collaborative medium, because I think that's another thing that you can really cement with teachers is it's not, I mean, you can be a triple threat. I definitely do a lot of that when I self-publish, but it takes you longer. So most of the big comics, you know, you have your inker, you have your penciler, you have your colorist, you have your letterer, you have the publisher, the editors, like it's a group project. And so um, when I've done classroom publications, we've actually done that. We've kind of assigned different roles. So if we have a student that really, really loves to draw and everybody in the class is like, oh, they need to draw this, then they might be our, our penciler. And then someone else comes in and does the inks and somebody comes in and does the colors. And then I had a girl who was really good at spelling, do all of our spell check and our editing. And then we actually put it together and published a little comic from their classroom. So they created like a whole coherent comic together and um, they all got a chance to go home with that. And um, Usually I keep uh, on my website, I actually keep a little spot where you can message me because I've actually had that where I had a one day comic workshop with this one student and I loved his comic. It was about ninjas. It's actually still on my Instagram. It was just like so cool how he did it. It was one of my first classes and he actually found me like five years later and was like, hey, I'm doing comics. And I was wondering if you could connect me to somebody. And I was like, yeah, I know all kinds of people. So I connected to him and he's actually working in the industry now. So I keep that spot on my website so that I can do that. And I encourage students to kind of reach out. And like you said, there's honestly like, it, there's not one specific art style for comics. You can do like stick figures, you can do scribbles, you can do silent comics. There's this really great comic that I helped fund on Kickstarter called The Bully's Bully that has like no words and it's all just facial expressions and tells the whole story that way. And I, I do a lot of that too when we're doing character studies is just playing with the eyebrows and the mouth to change their facial expressions. It's a really good way of helping kids kind of um, play around with expression without having to think about the whole face. And then they move forward, like, and can do that when they start to get more realistic. But we just kind of play with, like, changing the eyebrows. Like, eyebrows go up and a smile, or you push them down and they're frowning. Like, um, I, so, yeah. I even have to explain that to adults sometimes, that wordless comics are still written. You know, I mean, I remember I grew up with Spy versus Spy. There's a story. You know, you had to write the story, but you have to show it with visuals. I, mean, I think that's, that's what's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I'll turn to um, Kathy for the same question in terms of nitty gritty teaching, uh, materials you might use, and, and how you actually get the kids uh, involved in this. Yeah, so I, um, I'm, I sort of focus on like ideation, I would say. Um, I always start out all my drawing, all my comic book workshops or my, all my classes, all my classes, uh, start out with a just a warm up drawing game. So like I have them draw monsters, have it be collaborative. Um, I have games called like Monster Roundtable is one. Animal Mashup is kind of a classic where you get a list of animals and then you number them and then you roll a d20 and you have to mash up a koala dragon or something like that. That one's also always a classic. Um, but just like encourage students to just be like, hey, this is about just like get them drawing, get them to not care. Um, not like, I feel like you can get really bogged down by like, I have to draw good, right? Just be like, hey, I have a game called Object Quick Draw where I put like 10 second timer on my phone and I'm like, draw a flower, draw a heart, draw. And then they just draw a lot. And then I'm like, see how fast you can draw things that are still recognizable, like hammers or whatever it is. Um, just get them sort of used to getting loose, getting fast, have it be more about communication than like a good drawing, right? And then, um, and then I we build characters. So I start out with sort of a character model. So like I'm like, okay, here's a character. Let's think of some stats. Like what is their name? Where do they live? Did they have they moved from anywhere? Um, who are their friends? Who are their family? Um, do they have any superpowers? I want to make sure like. There's so many people who are, are all about smile. So like, I want to make sure like I have special, special abilities. Because <laughs> superpowers isn't always where kids are at. 
Um, <laughs> but like, so they got a whole character. And then once you start with a character where their name, what their name is, what they want from life, what they're afraid of, then the story easily kind of builds from there because they already have this all. It's all about like little building blocks for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, uh, I haven't done, I have like for my high schoolers, I have them have write a script, do the thumbnail, do the kind of more like professional sort of model. Um, but for my younger kids, like my middle schoolers and my elementary school kids, we're just sort of, uh, we kind of run wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another thing is, is even my high schoolers, man, panels are like so annoying to draw. So I actually just like print them off panels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uniform like, panel comic. Here, here's your panels. That's just easy. Even me, I print them off for myself <laughs> professionally because they're so annoying to draw. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I guess I, as you can see, I, I'm all about the chaos and like just like having a good time. That's what, what's really important is just having a good time. Yeah. And then I mean, also, just like, sorry, just like Michael no. and Christina said, printing the book, having a sort of a final anthology, a class anthology where they can share with each other and bring it home and share with their families, um, bring it to the local public library so everyone else in the community can borrow it. Um, there's just, uh, there's something really, that's the magical part is the publishing part and sharing yeah, it. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. like what, that's the essence of art, right? Is a new method of communication. So yeah. that Any, giving that. Anytime I've seen anything of mine in print, it's just that special moment. You're like, yeah. oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, the only thing I was going to throw in before I want to turn to, uh, carry with a, a question, but, um, working with Lincoln Purse on his stuff, he, he taught me something really simple when he works on his, uh, on his novels, he has this whole thing where it, he comes up with this, it's somebody wanted, but so. So in other words, this is your person, this is what they want, something stopped them, this is what they did. And I'm like, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's like, so I use that a lot, even and he uses it all the time in his writing. And I'm like, that's a great simplification of how that works. It's even a four panel comic, you know, you can do that with a four panel comic. Um, Carrie, I wanted to ask you, turning to, uh, turning comics to maybe other academic things, uh, you know, working with a, a history class or, or English or, or engineering STEM classes. Um, in my own personal experience, I had a history teacher who really encouraged me to do one of the projects uh, with a lot of comic art in it. And what was great about it is I had to then research the costumes from the time period and all that kind of stuff. It really got me involved in that. I was wondering if you had any suggestions from an academic perspective, working with other classes, having the art teachers or the people uh, bringing them into this world as well, how would you do that? Yeah, um, well, actually, I am, I, I, start, I started reading comics when I was in elementary school. I started with Archie, actually. And even when I was reading Archie when I was young, I, I looked at the art a lot and, you know, became a person in the visual arts. Started, I was in art, um, gifted and talented programs along the way, and then I became an art teacher first. And so... It, teaching art has always been um, about learning through the material, learning, you know, how to create through the material. And so the use of material is, and I think the use of material is critically important in comics as well, but I think everyone really needs to understand that you can make comics with any material. It doesn't matter what the material is. I have students who make comics three-dimensionally. Hmm. Um, so you can choose whatever material is appropriate for that particular student in that particular storyline, but you know, don't, I hope people aren't feeling limited to the pencil or limited to the software or whatever it is, because you can create comics with anything. Um, we've, I've had, I had a student do comics in wet sand, you know, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Um, but what's kind of interesting to me is that all of the things that, um, Christine and Kathy were talking about, I, I use in my classes for teachers as well. Now that I'm teaching teachers, those are the exact same procedures that we go through when I help teachers learn how to teach comics and how to guide kids to learn through comics. One of the things that's different is that I focus a lot on helping teachers to understand tacit knowledge. Um, we use tacit knowledge all the time. It's the foundation of art education. Tacit knowledge is the knowledge you can't put into words. And in the, in the visual arts, we use tacit knowledge, both visually and kinesthetically. 
And that's what we try to teach kids. You know, that, that's one of the things we try to teach kids through art education. Um, it's different from, you know, the interdisciplinary types of knowledge that you were referring to, Tom, but it's a foundation of a lot of knowledge in those other subject areas that people aren't aware of. There, there is a lot of tacit knowledge involved in, you know, math and science and social studies and so on and that people don't, that they're, that people don't make as important as perhaps it should be. And where folks, including kids, learn about that test knowledge often directly is through the visual arts, through art education and other, and other arts as well, you know, drama and music and so on. So it's that connection that, you know, helping kids understand there is this thing called tacit knowledge, what it feels like, what it looks like, and how to become aware of it is a lot of what art education, the arts education does. And that can help kids grab onto that a little bit better in other subject areas so that they understand, yes, there is this stuff that they're teaching me through numbers or words, but there's also this other thing that is so important for learning and creativity um, that you can't necessarily put into words or numbers. Uh, Michael, I'd like you to weigh in on this in terms of like uh, possibly getting, uh, you know, other teachers involved. And, and if you're a history teacher and you want to get involved with the art teacher, how do they approach this or they want to bring in comics or how do art teachers reach out to the other teachers? Do you have any suggestions on that in terms of helping create comics throughout the educational process? Yeah, we had a program in Cleveland in 2006 and seven funded by the Cleveland Foundation where art teachers partnered with disciplinary teachers, history, math, and so on. And they wrote their manuscripts and the storyboards like Christina had mentioned in the history class or the science class. And they developed the art in the art class. And it became this really wonderful collaboration between teachers who had never talked to each other before. A number of the teachers were like, I had never talked to the history teacher before and the same with the art teacher. And now they were working together in a very collaborative way. And so I think, you know, the medium of comics really lends itself to telling stories, developing characters, as everybody has said, and also doing research, like uh, Christina mentioned as well, researching this historical character, bringing it to life, putting it in the comic, collaborating with the art teacher. There's a lot of really wonderful pathways there, um, but schools need to sort of loosen the reins in order to, you know, let that happen. So collaborating periods, uh, co-teaching periods, things like that, things like that take some support from administration. It's not always easy to do, but there's a lot of power there when it happens. Christina, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, specifically, um, working with a native population, uh, you know, getting those stories out is, is working with kids on that. Do they see the power of that? Do they see the power of the image and is uh, just wanted you to weigh in on that? Yeah. Uh, well, I've talked a little bit about sequential art just historically anyways, because, you know, with ledger art, with a lot of indigenous peoples actually use sequential art. You look at like hieroglyphics, you look at cave paintings, like all of that is like sequential art is just kind of a way that we've used to tell storytelling for the longest time. And um, with most of my students, uh, it kind of varies on different types of identities because you definitely have the students who are well aware of what their tribal affiliation is and they know their family's history. They know like all their customs and everything. So they might know their myths. And so if they want to create a comic that has to do with one of the stories they've told, and they might be like well aware of how to do that. But I also have students who have been displaced, who know that they're indigenous or Native American, but they don't know what tribe or they don't know how. And so um, a lot of the ones we've done is actually just kind of talking about the basic indigenous knowledge. So like star knowledge and some of the stories. And we actually did a, a video game camp <laughs> kind of similar to doing all the comics and everything was I had them kind of create their own video game based on some of the stories that they knew or heard of or, or like that they could share with their classmates. And um, a few years ago, I think it was 2015, we did a big class in collaboration with Pop Culture Classroom called Modern Myth Makers. And um, we just kind of sectioned it out. We talked about star knowledge. Uh, we looked at some existing comics that were done by native creators. Um, around 2015, there was actually this really awesome rise of 
Native comic artists where everybody was wanting to have more representation and more independent stories. So we saw things like Hero Twins coming out, Moonshot, all of these really cool collaborative anthologies that were all these different myths. So we used a lot of that in that class. Um, and, you know, some of the kids kind of came up with their own uh, stories and their own constellations. That was actually my favorite part mm. of that whole um, workshop was we put out a big black sheet of paper. And since we were talking about uh, all this star knowledge and assigning stories to different constellations, because, you know, you have the big dip dipper can be something completely different to another person or another um, culture across the world, but it's the same constellation. So the kids actually just kind of went to town and splattered stars all over this black sheet of paper and came up with their own stories of what those constellations were. And then we like stretched it out and had them all lay down as if they were underneath the starry sky and we went through and they got to tell the stories of what each constellation was. And, you know, being kids, we got like space pandas and like pizza cats and like <laughs> all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, yeah, I believe in space pandas. That's not a conspiracy. Right? Yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. But, um, you know, I think that's one of my favorite things about comics is like what we've mentioned, the collaboration of it is actually being able to share that perspective and to be able to talk to other people and to kind of broaden your horizons on stories that you know, because no story is the same to one person. You know, all of us are experiencing life through a different lens. So I think it's really awesome to be able to collaborate and to be able to do your research and do history projects, do language projects using art and everything. I actually use, um, I use Pixton to do a language class. We we're talking about Lakota language and I just had them in the same way that you would plug in like the, hi, how are you? This is my name. Like we actually just did it in that language um, in specifically Lakota language. But I was like, you could use this for Spanish. You could use this for Russian. You could use it for like any kind of language that you're trying to teach. And um, I even actually did it with ASL because I'm actually trying to learn ASL because I, I talk with my hands a lot. So I was like, I might as well be like communicating while I'm doing this. Um, and I started doing that with comics because I had an art teacher who had us in a way of practicing drawing hands. She had us write out our favorite song lyric using ASL motions with our hands. So we had to draw each individual hand to write out the song lyric, but it got me really good at drawing hands. Yeah. And um, actually I was like, well, now I know how to sign that part of my favorite song lyric. So like it's kind of two, <laughs> killed two birds with one stone. And I think that's like my favorite part of being able to do all these comics is you're actually, you're learning multiple things on top of learning the art, you know, doing the storytelling, the history, like all of that is kind of, sneakily put in there especially with kids they don't always like to know that they're learning something so it's kind of fun later when they reflect and they're like oh they totally like they Mr. Miyagi'd me <laughs> you know now I, I learned something else there I think I think that sums up comics in general in education we're Mr. Miyagi'ing everybody we're just <laughs> right in, exactly. I love that that's also a great way to force artists to learn how to do hands I love that because we all hate to do that so that's beautiful what a great idea yeah um I wanted to spend the last few minutes uh, basically uh, talking about uh, resources or books you recommend and things like that. So Carrie, uh, obviously, uh, as a representative of Reading with Pictures, I'm sure there's a ton of resources on, on, on this site uh, that you can find out. Uh, do you, so you want to talk a little bit about that and anything else you might want to recommend that teachers to get more involved in this? Yes, go to the Reading with, Reading with Pictures website immediately, right away. There's heaps of resources there, um, lots of fun things to look at, lots of things for all age levels. Um, we're just developing right now a database of um, comics for kids based on grade level, um, but there are others out there, you know, like Mavericks and so, so that sort of thing. But uh, Reading with Pictures is also a really good resource. And um, <clears throat> one thing I do want to say is that, you know, one of the limitations of using comics in schools is just teacher knowledge or teacher awareness. So please, um, you know, teachers, please just don't rely on resources that is, you know, comics to teach my kids or something like that. You know, it's, it's a lot about having kids just make comics on their own, make comics that they're interested in, using subject matters that they're interested in. It's a lot about interest 
when it comes to using comics in school. So yes, research is obviously important and helpful, but um, just as everyone's talked about in this panel so far, it's just a lot about kids' interest. One of my favorite things watching, uh, I have uh, two daughters who are 16 and 13, and I love how the comics world has become so diverse. And I can show them a book like March, or I can read uh, um, um, David Walker's uh, uh, Frederick Douglass. I mean, all these things are just amazing. Here, read this. This is important. And I love that. I love that this has gone from Spider-Man to here. And I love being able to see all this happen. Uh, Michael, same question for you. Uh, resources that you would recommend uh, that you have personally or things that you've used? One of the things I will just say is when uh, we've asked kids to create comics, we've learned over the years that if you use a professionally published comic as an example, sometimes kids will be like, this is amazing, but I can't draw that. And it can actually be a barrier to them entering the comics world, unless it's, you know, introduced by somebody who's, you know, very sort of supportive and caring. So one of the things that we've really encouraged is uh, sharing comics created by other kids uh, as models. And so on our website at comicbookproject.org, there's a page called Comics by Kids. And there's just free PDF documents that you can just click on and download from there. And so I would just recommend that as you're entering this world of helping kids create comics, try to use other kids' comics as models, at least in part uh, alongside of professionally published comics, um, because that can be a great um, pathway for them to create their own and see what kind of stories they like, what kind of characters and styles and so on. That is a, a great tip. I even do that with my own kids. I didn't draw with them as much when they were younger because I didn't want to intimidate them. Not that I'm that great, but you can draw Mickey Mouse and then they're like, I can't draw Mickey Mouse. So, <laughs> so I would sort of just, you know, back off. And I, I think that's a wonderful tip. I love that. Um, Kathy, anything from you, uh, resources that you particularly love or, or things you would uh, have teachers look at to learn a little bit more? Yeah, so um, my favorite books are, um, so since I wrote my thesis on this not that long ago, I have like an entire collection of basically everything that's about comics and education, um, which I'm sure I've referenced Carrie and Michael, <laughs> like, I bet you're referenced, <laughs> cite, cited in my thesis. Um, but I, what I really like, the ones that really come to the surface for me are the ones by artist teachers, the ones who have art creator perspective first, not like um, English teacher perspective first. Um, so I, uh, Ivan Brunetti's cartooning, um, this is, he sort of talks about his syllabus for a, a college level class, but you can always uh, find new, you can always, uh, your teachers, you can, what is, what's the word, <laughs> scaffold it, you can. <laughs> Scaffolding works, I like that. You know what I mean. <laughs> um, this one is great. Raina Telgemeier did a Share Your Smile. Um, and this has just different activities, um, like school stories, just brainstorming stuff. Um, I have, uh, I'm so sorry, Scholastic, but I have so many Xeroxes of this. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that from us. <laughs> and then uh, Linda Berry, classic, genius. Uh, syllabus where she talks about just all sorts of different activities and again I actually find this one be more directed towards adults because she's generally working with uh, college age mm -hmm. kids but you can always uh, find ways to make it more age appropriate um, but again she like Linda Berry's work she's uh, agree she's <laughs> a MacArthur genius but you know you yeah. see the quality of her drawing and it's very accessible um, just like what Michael was saying. And then she has a new one also called Making Comics. Uh, the, yep, there you go. Um, and I haven't, I haven't worked with this one as much because it did just recently come out and we are recently coming out of the pandemic. So, but <laughs> syllabus, I have <laughs> marked up quite a bit. <laughs> and those are my favorite because I, I, I do like that they're all cartoonists um, and that their approach is so from an artist's perspective. I've been reading Linda Barry since she was, you know, a zillion years ago back in the independent things. And I, I've talked to a million people, interviewed a lot of people. I don't get choked up too much. I'm almost terrified of her. I've met her like twice and I'm just like, oh my God, it's Linda Barry. So <laughs> something about it. I don't know what it is. Um, Christina, any suggestions or, or sites or anything that you wanted to talk about really quickly? Yeah, I would definitely say um, Pop Culture Classroom if you're in the Colorado area. Um, and actually even more so because they have their colorful history section where it's a lot of comic history things. Um, I have one in there that's a Tale of Sand Creek. So it's a little bit, it comes with its own curriculum. So they're all free downloads. 
so they have the comic and they're paired with different curriculum um, to teach for classrooms. I think it's third grade through fifth grade. And then um, I use Pixton a lot. It's particularly just um, kind of like digital comics where the kids actually don't have to read or don't have to draw. So if it is uh, you want to use comics in the classroom, like a math classroom or something, and you might not have the time to cover all of the art aspects of comics, Pixton has been really awesome because they have a ton of different characters, all different skin tones, like even blue and purple, like all different types of um, faces. You can do the expressions. It's kind of like a custom, you just drag and drop and you can do like your own little backgrounds. You can even scan in like pictures to put in a background. And then it comes like with preloaded like little word bubbles that you just type in. Um, that was a really awesome tool during the pandemic. Do trying to do online comic classes was like really really hard, especially because I had some really little ones and um, they got picked in pretty quick. You know, they, they were like age five to six, and mm. uh, that would have been really hard to do without having that virtual platform of that picked in. So it's a great website if you're wanting to kind of get into doing comics, but don't have time to cover all of the art and the um, drawing aspects, but yeah. <laughs> all right, well, you know, as always, whenever I do these panels, I learn something and I meet incredibly inspiring people. I love this aspect of comics. I love how I've seen it grow to this point. And I'm so excited to be a part of it. I want to thank everybody here, Michael Bitts, Carrie Friedman, Kathy G. Johnson, and Christina Maldonado-Badhand. Uh, you guys were great. Um, thank you for being here and for sharing your expertise. Thank you. I'm excited to look up everybody's references. I have like, I wrote it all down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.